Okay, it's 1.32 now, uh, so we'll go ahead and get the, uh, the show started. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome back to some of you. My name is Jared Bly, and I serve as ANCA's Clean Energy Program Director. I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth session on uh, day two of OnRamp. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for another round of informative presentations and an engaging Q&A segment. This session will focus on charging infrastructure for the 2023 World University Games being held in Lake Placid, New York and the surrounding Olympic region. Our vision for this event is to establish the foundation for an inclusive region-wide transition to low carbon transportation future. Uh, so before we begin, I have a, a few housekeeping items I'd like to share. First, OnRamp's virtual format offers several sessions over five days with plenty of time between to learn, process, and connect. Please note that these sessions will, will be recorded and made available after the event is finished. Uh, while we begin each day with video on, participants' microphones and video will be turned off during speaker presentations. Please utilize the chat box feature at the bottom of your screen to send in questions, and we do highly encourage you to um, to formulate questions and to ask them at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to update your name or add pronouns, click on the participant button at the bottom of your screen and scroll over to your name and select rename. There is no scheduled break during our session, session so if you need to step away from your computer at any point, please feel free to do so. Um, next, I want to recognize and thank the organizations that have made this event possible through their generous support. Uh, first to our partners at the State of New York. These are NYSERDA, the New York Power Authority, and New York Green Bank. And to our sponsors, our session sponsor is National Grid. Our roadmap sponsors are Community Bank, Hodgson Rust LLP, and Novabus. And our plug-in sponsors are Clarkson University, International Paper, and Line Electric. The moderator for the session is Ben Foster. Um, ben, president of Fostera LLC, delivers, which delivers green energy and clean transportation leadership to the commercial, government, and education and utility sectors. He is a champion for programs that have a positive impact on the environment and create robust outcomes for buyers, investors, and the clean energy market at large. Mr. Foster has worked on projects in over 500 jurisdictions across the United States and in China at various stages of development from planning through operations. As an industry leader, Ben has managed over a dozen regional collaborative efforts to improve best practices and deploy them domestically and internationally through federally funded projects, industry white papers, technical reports, best practice guides, and hands-on expert technical assistance and training. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Ben, who will share a little bit about his current work before we introduce our next lineup of excellent panelists. Uh, so Ben, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Jared. Uh, can you hear me okay? Audio is good. Good. Thank you. And thank you all for, uh, at Anka for having this summit and uh, inviting me to be part of this summit. And we have a great group of panelists today on our working group session two, which is on charging infrastructure. I appreciate Anka's leadership to move the region forward through this initiative and all of your efforts uh, to date and looking forward. So I'm excited about this uh, overall on-ramp uh, initiative and program because it really demonstrates a regional commitment to the future, to new technologies and helping capture those opportunities in a growing and forward thinking community. So with that, I'd like to kick off this working group session with just a few points, uh, and then we'll hear from our expert panelists, because I know that's what uh, it's gonna be most exciting for this session. Um, what you see first is a couple of things just to tee it up. So one is the summit goal. Um, you've probably seen this if you're in the earlier sessions, and it's certainly part of the program overall. Um, the way I would summarize this is essentially a question of how do we leverage the World University Games, the event itself, to build momentum for action today and into the future. So at a large, large uh, overall view, that's what I think we're trying to accomplish here. And then within our workshop or this particular working group, 
is I'm hoping that the speakers and the audience, those of you who joined today, to take time out of your busy day to, to be part of this event, will help to examine the needs and strategies that we have for the game's clean transportation charging network build out with a focus on solutions that will benefit the region beyond 2023. So essentially, how do we think strategically while capturing short-term opportunities for the 2023 games and other programs? Um, you'll hear in here that we have uh, a term EVSE. I'll use that probably. Some of the other speakers may use that. That's a shorthand for electric vehicle supply equipment, which essentially is an overlap of or a similar description of what we're talking about on the EV electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So if you see that um, acronym, then that's, that's what we mean. Now this is a unique opportunity for the region and I wanna thank you all for being part of this today. As you can see, we have an outstanding lineup of speakers and I'll introduce them briefly through their bios first and then we'll jump into the speaker. But before that, I'll have one more thing that I wanna to cover to help encourage participation. Here we go to the next slide. So we'll have time for questions and answers from the speakers after their presentations, after we get through all of the four presentations. During the session though, you have access to the chat box, which is that link at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, what we'd love to do is for you to add your comments, add your questions, add your ideas into the chat box as we're going along so that you can make sure to share that with us. This is a working group, so we wanna harvest as much of that information and input as you have and ideas. And some ways to think about those ideas uh, and get them flowing is a couple of things to, to think about. And of course, you'll hear all kinds of other topics from the speaker, so make sure to, to build off of those as well. But from your perspectives, and you, I'm sure you all bring your own individual perspective on this, one is what are some ways to work regionally in the next two to five years to increase EV adoption and EVSE deployment? That's our main focus for this, for this session. Um, what are some major technical and economic challenges that you see or that you've heard of or that you're concerned about or barriers to rapidly increasing EV adoption? Not just organic slow growth that we've seen, but if we want to really take a dramatic step forward, what are some barriers that we see or how are some ways to unlock that? And then since this is your opportunity to hear from four leading experts from uh, leading organizations across the state and nationally, what areas would you like them to focus on? to help support the region? What are the asks? If we had an ask for them, what would they be? So think about those as we're going through. Now I wanna introduce uh, our four, I'll introduce all four of our speakers first and then we'll jump into the first one. Now, Rebecca Hughes is the Senior Program Manager for NYPA's Evolve NY program where she leads marketing and customer engagement efforts related to transportation electrification. She served previously as Program Manager for marketing and training for the New York Energy Manager which is a virtual energy management service of NYPA. And prior to joining NYPA in 2017, she managed workforce development for NYSERDA for eight years. So she's been in multiple entities related to this industry. And she'll be discussing New York's EV charging landscape and the NYPA Evolve NY program. After that, we'll hear from Adam Ruder. He's the assistant director for NYSERDA's Clean Transportation Group, which focuses on developing and demonstrating new technologies, policies, and business models that support electric vehicles, public transportation and mobility management. Adam has led the implementation of Governor Cuomo's Charge NY initiative to advance electric vehicle adoption in New York State. And he closely collaborates with other states and the federal government to jointly advance EV policies and programs. And Adam will be providing an overview of NYSERDA's Clean Transportation Group and the Charge NY initiative. Kevin George Miller is Director of Public Policy for ChargePoint. Kevin works with legislatures and regulatory agencies throughout the Northeast and Midwest to overcome barriers for transportation electrification, as well as on US federal policy. Kevin's areas of expertise include fiscal policy and strategy development for zero emissions infrastructure. And Kevin will be discussing ChargePoint's EV charging network platform, including a discussion on regulatory barriers to transportation electrification. And Travis Allen is the Vice President, Public Affairs and General Counsel at Flow. That's an electric vehicle charging network and manufacturer of charging solutions. Travis's work throughout North America focuses on climate policy, Canadian electric mobility, and a variety of legal matters. And he'll be providing an overview of vehicle charging networks and electric vehicle and climate policy. So with that, I'd like to turn over to Rebecca Hughes from NYPA. Thank you. Let me just pull up my presentation here. 
And if you'd kindly let me know and you can see it. Good, Jared. Okay, I'm gonna go into presentation mode and I might not be able to see you guys. So use a verbal cue if, if I have an audio issue or if there's anything you need to get my attention on. Let's see. All right, here we go. The computer's doing its magic to pull into full screen. So hopefully everyone can see what they're looking at on their screen. Um, while I'm waiting for that, it's it's so great to see so many familiar names and in some cases faces on this meeting. Um, I would love to all be gathered in the beautiful North Country in this late fall and, you know, just to, to be interacting with you guys, but this is the next best thing. Um, and I also appreciate the opportunity to, you know, get dressed for a day and, <laughs> and to interact with other people in this space. So thank you for that. Um, you know, just given the audience, I know that some of this is going to be a little bit basic, so please bear with me. Um, for those of you um, for whom this is really elementary, but I just wanted to give a bit of an overview of New York State's electric vehicle goals, where we are with charging, a little bit of perspective on the different use cases for different types of chargers, and then lastly, what Evolve New York is doing and why. Um, so thanks to some of the ambitious goals that Governor Cuomo has set, New York has a goal of 850,000 EVs, fully electric vehicles, on the road by 2025. Um, this is warp speed in terms of market transformation. So we've got a lot of work to do from here. Um, and that goal is 3 million by 2030. Um, so for fast chargers, that means that we've got to have really substantial infrastructure to support all of those vehicles traversing the state. Um, so, you know, right now there are about 47,000 EVs on the road. Again, looking at that upward curve going to 850,000 and then 3 million, um, we estimate that we need direct current fast charging. So truly fast charging, um, you know, about two of those for every thousand vehicles on the road. So we can look out ahead to infrastructure development and see that we've got a lot of work to do there too in terms of um, installation of fast charging. And we'll get into a little bit of what that means when we say fast charging. There's a lot of nomenclature that's still really nascent in the industry as well. Um, but in order to meet that goal, um, we would really need to have um, at least about 1,600 fast chargers on New York's roadways and communities by 2025. And, you know, we think a more realistic estimate would be about 4,200 direct current fast chargers across New York by 2025. And then likewise, of course, that grows exponentially as we see that mass market adoption start to take place. So there's a lot of charging in New York today. We can, the source of this data is from ChargePoint. Um, or from PlugShare rather, sorry, I got, I've got my co-presenter on the brain there. So from PlugShare, we can see that there are nearly 5,000 level two chargers across New York. So if we're glancing at this map, the charging landscape looks pretty dense and that that would support most of the EV drivers on the road today. Um, I like to come back to use cases. So a level two charger is, you know, similar to an upgrade you might put in your garage. It's that you know, roughly 240 volt outlet. It's kind of like a dryer, um, you know, kind of plug, an upgrade from your typical wall outlet. Um, so these are the chargers that you're typically gonna see at work, um, that you're gonna maybe install at your home, that you're gonna see at your local shopping plaza. A lot of times these are free um, and offered as an amenity to customers to draw people into a store. So if you're not fully charged, you might use these to pop off. If you're taking maybe an overnight stop, you would certainly see these at hotels and use those for an overnight stop. So those you know, serve a really valuable purpose for certain use cases across New York State. So this is all the chargers, including level two and what we call fast. Um, when we filter out level two chargers and we only look at direct current fast chargers, you can see that that map changes dramatically and that we've got a much sparser um, distribution of chargers across the state, especially when we look up at the North Country, there are very, very few. When we say direct current, um, you know, when you're plugging into a level one, which is your standard outlet, or a level two, which is that more powerful version, um, you're talking about alternating current charging direct current charging, and that connects to the car's charger. The charger is actually in the car. That's why when you see those level two chargers out and about, they're very small, they're slim, they're easy to place in an existing parking lot. 
direct current fast chargers go directly to the battery. And there are these big behemoths that you might see at like an Electrify America site or that you might see at a Tesla site at your local mall. So when we look at those direct current fast chargers that can charge a car up to 80% in less than an hour, um, we get down to 127 stations with about 550 outlets or ports. So think about a station like a gas station, you've got multiple chargers at a given station perhaps, or maybe just one, um, but that's just a little of the nomenclature there. Now, what we refer to as fast or very fast, this is really fluid in the industry right now. That's not a scientific term, um, but a fast charger or a DC fast charger is usually about 50 kilowatts or greater. Um, when we talk about very fast, that is 150 kilowatts or greater, meaning that you can charge up to 80% in less than 30 minutes. Um, and as a marketer, this is really important to me because when I think about market transformation, I'm thinking about reducing complexity and making this technology more compatible. So the industry is moving more and more towards something similar to a gasoline experience. And you would use these types of fast chargers not on an everyday basis, um, but more so on a road trip or if you're a rideshare operator and you're charging very, very frequently, or maybe you don't have charging at home or work and you need a reliable place to fill up quickly and recharge. So, you know, those, those stations are even more sparse. And then when we remove um, Tesla from that equation, we lose the North Country entirely. Um, and only 38 stations remain, 38 outlets at 10 stations right now, um, mainly in areas with higher population density. So these machines are super expensive to install. We'll talk a little bit about some of the economics and the regulatory barriers through the other presentations, I'm sure. Um, but you see that there's a lot of what we call charging deserts. So if you're on a road trip traveling um, through Western New York, this station um, near Buffalo has been down recently, you're stranded. You're gonna be stuck adding hours to your trip. Um, so I think this is a good illustration of how kind of nascent this aspect of the industry is. Um, so that brings us to uh, the work that Evolve New York is doing. So we are a direct current fast charging um, owner and operator. We are part of the New York Power Authority and we were really formed on the basis of um, this chicken and egg conundrum. So with so few fast chargers on the road, developers can't put that upfront capital in to install this higher price, um, higher speed charging across the state. Um, so they're waiting on the vehicles to tell them that they're going to have revenues that can help them to achieve um, a payback in a reasonable amount of time during the useful life of the equipment. Um, whereas drivers might be waiting for a more robust fast charging network. So this is where we get that dynamic tension between the supply and the demand. Um, so our role is really to catalyze private investment. It's to solve those charging deserts and to make sure that EVs are an easier choice for all New Yorkers. Likewise, you see heavier investment downstate, and there's a reason for that. There's more EVs there, there's higher population density. Um, so we're also investing in stations, um, you know, that are gonna be less profitable, frankly. Um, those that might have less traffic, but we can ensure that we're serving downtown areas, rural and urban environments, as well as um, stations along transportation corridors like the Adirondack Northway, um, for example. So we've got a few North Country stations coming online in the next couple of months. We'll be out doing ribbon cuttings at those. We're opening at Watertown, Scroon Lake, and Malone. Um, we've also got sites that we're um, in negotiation on for Plattsburgh as well as Lake Placid. So we're really starting with geography. We look at where are those gaps? What, where would you know a, fast, a lack of fast charging prohibit you from completing a great road trip or getting to your destination? Um, we also look at grid capacity. So where is there enough power on the existing grid without major costly upgrades that we could account for these types of chargers? Um, they have their own transformer, their whole system in and of themselves. And then lastly, as a marketer, I come back to the bathrooms. So when you're on a road trip and you need to make a 20 minute pit stop, um, you know, who's a site host, private, private site hosts who have great bathrooms, who have access to food and seating and all those things that you're going to need for a convenient stop because again 
um, you know, we want to make these compatible with people's lives. An early adopter, someone who takes on that technology very, very early in its development, is going to be willing to bend over backwards to accommodate that technology in their lives. But if we're looking at that um, adoption curve, achieving its hockey stick kind of upward trajectory, um, it's really critical that we meet the rest of the New York, you know, where they are. So how can we make sure that we're not using confusing nomenclature if somebody solved that question of how to talk about electric refueling in terms that people understand, I'd love to hear about it. Um, and how do we make this less, you know, more compatible? How do we make it more like a gasoline stop so that you don't feel like a road trip is out of your, um, you know, out of the possibility? And I think that this, you know, confluence of looking at the World University Games and electrification is such a beautiful thing because here we've got young people coming from all over the globe. Um, these are the same people that are standing up and saying that climate change is real and I want a cleaner environment for my own future and for my kids. And I think it's great that, um, you know, that the World University Games and their partners like Anka and Clarkson are looking at electrification as an aspect of, um, you know, kind of the personality of the games. Um, sorry, I'm just waiting for my slide to advance. So this is just a quick image of what our charging stations look like. Again, they're very large. These are about eight feet tall, transformer in the background. And then lastly, for any haters out there who say those are unattainable goals around consumer adoption, here are some technologies um, and they're really monumental adoption curves. Um, you know, we see that the market adapts very quickly to technology when it makes sense and can fit with people's lives and offer a benefit. So, um, you know, we're really optimistic that New York has an electric future. Um, and that's not just New Yorkers who can afford a high-end Tesla. We believe that electric should be an option for everyone. And that's a big part of our infrastructure investments that we're making. All right, that's all I got. I'm gonna pass it back to Ben and we'll hold questions at the end. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate that. And it's uh, so interesting to see the trends and the needs statewide and, and certainly regionally, a big, big gap there, right, in the North Country. So how do we solve that gap? Um, and it's great to know you guys are there to help find those solutions. So um, hopefully we'll get some good questions for you from the participants. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Adam Ruder from NYSERDA. Great. Thank you, Ben. And, and uh, thank you to everyone for, for coming and uh, looking forward to this uh, great discussion. Um, so uh, if you've been part of all of these uh, discussions, you may recognize a few of the slides, which uh, 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 were also uh, presented by my colleague, uh, John Lochner, on his presentation yesterday. But uh, I figured that uh, this would be a uh that there would be enough folks who hadn't seen those that it, it was worth rehashing a few of those and then and then i have uh some new ground to cover as well so uh next slide and uh similar to uh to what rebecca said uh want to really highlight the uh great uh achievements and and commitments that Governor Cuomo and and the New York State team have made over the last few years um, you know we uh, Rebecca mentioned some of the goals for EV infrastructure across the state and and the major investments uh, we have rebate programs uh, for consumers we have NIPA's uh, Evolve New York program um, a major investment from uh, the Public Service Commission uh, through the utilities that that is uh, just getting off the ground, Volkswagen settlement funds, and uh, and a commitment from the major transit operators in the state to uh, run only electric buses by 2040. So there's a lot going on in New York State, and uh, and and we're continuing to make good progress. There's a lot on this slide, but uh, I really just wanted to highlight here that. Um, the number of electric vehicles in the state is increasing, and uh, and as Rebecca mentioned, a lot of the focus of electric vehicle adoption has been downstate, uh, but there is EV adoption across the state. And if you go to the next slide, I highlighted just the North Country, um, and you'll see that 
there are more plug-in hybrids in the in the North Country, which can run on electric, and then when that uh, when that runs out, they they can run on gasoline. Um, but uh, there are quite a few uh, all electric vehicles, and they are uh, spread across the the region, um, and they are all different shapes and sizes, uh, and and in that way, they do look a lot like the rest of the um, uh, the rest of the state and and the rest of the country, and. It is important to keep in mind that especially in a place like the North Country, a lot of tourism uh, can be enhanced by having that uh, EV infrastructure and making sure that it is an inviting place for people who wanna drive down from Montreal or up from Albany or Boston or, or Vermont or wherever um, in their electric vehicles. Uh, next slide which as Rebecca mentioned as well, uh, is why the charging infrastructure is, is really important. And uh, this looks at both uh, level two and fast charging uh, ports in the state and uh, in, in, in the North country right now. Um, most, uh, as I noted, are level two charging stations, but uh, there are some uh, fast chargers. They're, they're primarily te uh, for Tesla only at this point. And uh, certainly, uh, the what Rebecca mentioned with the sites that are on the way in the North Country is a really exciting development and, and something that I think is really going to open up uh, the region for EV drivers. So, so thank you, uh, NIPA, for, for your commitment there, and, and we look forward to those uh, being completed. Next slide. Um, to, to move beyond where we are now, and because we know that we need to do more, um, we New York State does offer a number of uh, programs to help get uh, more charging stations in place. For the level two charging stations, which as Rebecca mentioned, um, are good for a place that you'll be for a little bit of time, somewhere between half an hour and, and a few hours, um, we offer $4,000 per plug um, re of a rebate uh, for putting those in at public locations, at workplaces, and at multifamily buildings. Um, and we've seen a huge amount of uptake in this. Uh, well over 1,500 uh, charging stations installed over the last year and a half so far, uh, two years. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, it's really accelerated the deployment of charging stations across the state. Uh, and and with this, I should point out, these have been spread out pretty well, uh, e pretty evenly across the state. It's not just downstate, it's not just in the cities. It, it really has been uh, impressive how, how widely uh, they've been spread across the state. On top of that, there's a business tax credit uh, that runs through 2022. Uh, I you know, we've, we've already talked about Evolve New York and, and then the utility programs that are coming online soon um, will be able to cover up a lot of the other expenses, all the installation costs up to the charger, um, a significant portion of that will be covered uh, by the utilities, which is a really exciting development as well. Next slide. And I know that the focus of this panel isn't on the vehicles, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, a little bit on the vehicle side that uh, we do have a rebate in New York State for up to $2,000 per vehicle uh, for electric cars, uh, depends on their electric range. And uh, we also have a program for electric trucks and buses uh, that uses some of the W settlement money and some other money uh, to get old dirty trucks off the road and replace them with clean electric ones. And, uh, and also, while there aren't as many toll roads up in the North Country, you, you can get toll discounts uh, uh, for your electric vehicles. You can also get discounts on charging in many utility service territories. Uh, so there are a lot of great reasons to buy an electric car uh, in New York State. So now I want to transition a bit to uh, thinking about electrifying the World University Games. Um, next slide. And the, the focus, you know, obviously the focus of this is on the charging side, but you really need to discuss the vehicle side as well when you're when you're thinking about charging because different vehicles charge at different rates uh, and and frankly you know some 
types of vehicles are more available than others uh, in an electric version right now. Electric transit buses, you can, you can get. A lot of transit agencies are buying them right now, but they have a really big price tag. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty big investment. Electric shuttle buses uh, are also available. Um, and, uh, you know, they're still, but they're still significantly more expensive than gasoline or diesel ones. Um, they aren't quite as widespread at this point as electric transit buses, but they're getting there. And then uh, some major car makers also are offering electric minivans and, and large SUVs, uh, primarily plug-in hybrids, but, but uh, still cover a lot of your needs. Um, and they are also a bit more expensive than gasoline versions, but, um, but the price is coming down. Um, one thing to consider is that the ranges of the vehicles are improving, but in cold weather like the North Country, um, it, uh, it is certainly a factor to, uh, to take into consideration because you can have a, a significant uh, penalty in cold weather uh, of having to run the heat and the batteries just uh, don't like cold weather as much and, and they, you, might, you most likely will not be able to get as much uh, range as you can in, on a nice, uh, nice fall day like today. Um, it's probably a little on the cool side up there, but uh, nice in the 60s down here. That's, that's good EV weather. Um, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that these trucks don't, uh, trucks and buses don't just show up on, on a lot near you and you go to the lot and you pick them up and you drive them home that day. Uh, there are long lead times. And while 2023 seems a long way away, uh, it's going to get close pretty quickly. Um, and you know, as as the theme of this uh, workshop goes, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to um, make sure that there's a long-term uh, benefit here, not just that short-term use. And um, you know, the vehicles are expensive, so you can't just go buy a million-dollar bus for three weeks worth of uh, service. You need to really figure out a strategy there. Uh, next slide. On the charging side, you know these different vehicle types each charge at different speeds, and uh, and you know an electric car might charge anywhere from seven kilowatts up through, as Rebecca mentioned, 150, or some of the new ones coming out are can are going to be able to charge it even faster than that. Uh, commercial trucks and smaller buses, uh, similarly, some of them you can charge at a slower rate, but some of them are going to be charging at a very high rate and. Yeah, 200 kilowatts or, or even with, for transit buses, 600 kilowatts, some of them. Uh, when you get two or three of those, uh, that's usually more power than is at a, a lot of sites. Uh, so especially for a short-term um, event, installing a lot of charging infrastructure is going to be very impractical. Uh, and there, fortunately, there are some solutions available. Uh, to use energy storage or renewable energy um, to lighten the load on the electric grid and reduce the costs of installing this. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there can be charging done overnight or in shor shorter bursts uh, throughout a vehicle's route. Um, so, you know, at a, at a event venue or a taxi stand or, or at a facility that the vehicles can park at overnight. So next slide. Uh, so some some thoughts I had uh, to start would be to work with uh, transit operators nearby or universities or manufacturers to see if there are ways you can uh, collaborate and and uh, have find use for vehicles for a short time uh, with the games and then put them into service for a longer period of time in some of those local settings. Um, and similarly, you know. If I'm sure that there are some, there's definitely some vehicle need, whether it's a high peak shuttle to the to the trailheads or uh, at at Whiteface and Gore or wherever, um, that you can uh, that you could use those for longer periods of time, and those certainly make sense to to go all out on. But um, trying to trying to find partnerships with um, with 
some of the the local partners um, who who could use these for longer term, I think could be very productive uh, route. Um, similarly, on the charging side, uh, there's some charging that is going to make sense uh, for the long term uh, that is going to be able to serve visitors, serve fleet vehicles, and um, investing in that makes sense and then figuring out what what uh, uh, temporary charging solutions could uh, could provide that surge capacity um, that is needed during the games so uh, there are some there are some solutions out there that are uh, not tied to the grid and those could potentially provide an opportunity for um, for charging during this short time. Um, you know, Lake Placid itself, uh, I've spent plenty of time there and uh, uh, right on Main Street certainly is, is a challenge to find parking and, and find, uh, and, and it can get backed up quite a bit. So you probably don't want people charging their cars uh, right on Main Street a lot of the time or, or buses, but uh, you could probably make use of a lot of the lots not too far off of Main Street uh, where you could have uh, use, use them for charging for visitors after, after the games. Um, and I, I think that for buses and shuttle vans and things like that, you could easily find some more out of the way locations where there already is uh, electricity, electric capacity available. Uh, so you don't need to do as much uh, upgrades to the charging for charging infrastructure. So that's some additional thoughts. Uh, looking forward to this conversation and uh, here are some links uh, to some of the programs I mentioned earlier. Uh, thank you. Great, thanks Adam. That was really helpful to see uh, overall what are some of the programs um, and goals and how that fits into NYSERDA's efforts. Um, and uh, some, I appreciate, I'm sure everyone appreciates seeing what you're thinking through for the game, some of the considerations on planning and deployment and that transition of taking the opportunities to electrify for the games and then um, position that for future benefit, right? Not just a temporary ben benefit. So thanks so much for that. Now we're gonna turn it over next to Kevin from ChargePoint. All right, well, thank you all so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, dialing in from Brooklyn. I really was looking forward to an in-person reason to uh, visit y'all, uh, but I'll have to just imagine the budding foliage. Uh, so I'm Kevin Miller. I'm the Director of Public Policy for ChargePoint. Uh, I've had the chance to meet some of you and, and really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, it's, a, it's a really exciting opportunity to dig into some of these key issues. So if we could go on to the next slide. Oh, I apologize for the uh, animations here. Uh, I thought I took all those out. All right, here we go. Uh, so uh, ChargePoint is, uh, if you're not familiar with us, the largest network of electric vehicle charging stations. So we build, design, and manufacture the hardware uh, for uh, folks to plug in wherever there's a need to do so, at home, at work, around town, or on the road. Um, in addition to providing uh, hardware solutions for level two and DC fast charging stations, we also provide industry leading software solutions. So all of our charging stations are networked so that you can find them on our app or on uh, a variety of other uh, online resources uh, so that we make sure that we've got our stations visible. Um, and so that our owners and operators can um, manage their use. So we've got about We've got over 115,000 charging spots uh, in our network, over 5,200 of which uh, are in New York State. And we, by and large, don't own a single one of them. All of our stations uh, in New York are New York owned and operated. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit of how our model works uh, in, in a slide or so, but um, uh, we facilitate uh, the operation of charging stations. Uh, and what we try and do is uh, connect folks who may not realize that they're already part of the uh, refueling ecosystem uh, to see what kind of role uh, that they could play. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I think I've already covered this content. Uh, so we're uh, again creating this new fueling network uh, and that's uh, to facilitate a shared transportation for folks like me uh, who can get away with not actually owning a personal vehicle. Uh, so I'm always really excited to focus on fleet electrification issues uh, just for selfish uh, reasons, uh, but for personal vehicles as well, as well as thinking about um, public and private duty fleets. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, 
I think these are going to be made available later. So I don't want to just read a lot of content. But what I think this is important to illustrate is that there isn't a one size fits all business model for EV charging. And I think the real key to make sure that the North Country is prepared uh, for uh, providing electric transportation options is to ensure that as this planning process takes place, we think about well, what are the particular use cases uh, where EV charging can take place? Who could be what we call a site host, as has been referenced uh, in the past two uh, presentations? How do we make sure that their interests in providing EV charging as an amenity um, aligns uh, with uh, their existing model? So workplaces providing charging for employees uh, retail locations providing a reason to come and visit. There are a lot of ways in which preparing for an event like this can piggyback, I think as Adam uh, really accurately illustrated, how can we ensure that we're not just creating one-off solutions, that we can create a robust network and then have self-sustaining investment because you're ensuring that folks have a reason to continue uh, to want to deploy EV charging stations. So if we could go to the next slide. Uh, so what I'd like to do is kind of break down some of the barriers that we see um, into two rough buckets. And uh, at the end of talking through some of these uh, issues, um, I'll have a few recommendations, things to think about, and potentially some opportunities to find some solutions to some of these issues. So when looking at barriers to deploying charging infrastructure, the first place that automatically comes to mind, I think, is, is the cost. But there's a lot that's baked in here. Uh, and so I think it's important to understand the different cost drivers. So looking at level two EV charging equipment, uh, I put together some rough numbers here uh, that are representative, not of charge points equipment alone, but looking industry-wide, what types of costs we expect to see. And it's important to look at the differences in costs for the equipment, as well as the installation. Um, the installation costs, in almost every case, are going to far outpace the cost of the equipment. And so what that really breaks down to is it costs a lot to retrofit uh, existing infrastructure uh, to install a charging station. Uh, if you're looking at a detached garage at your house, uh, you can plug in a level two charging station into a dryer plug right, as Rebecca pointed to earlier, uh, but in a lot of cases, uh, workplace or multi-unit dwelling or a retail commercial parking area isn't going to have that same flexibility. So the trenching, boring, the labor costs associated can uh, create uh, uh, the real challenge uh, for deployment in this case. So uh, some of the uh, programs that uh, have already been mentioned really help to overcome some of those barriers. And uh, when we get to the solutions, I want to you know, really make sure that we keep that in mind, that it's the installation piece that we have to think about. How do we overcome that? Is it only through incentives or can we think about some more uh, creative ways to do so moving forward? Um, if we could go to the next slide, we'll talk about DC fast charging. I don't want to go through all of these either, uh, reading them out, but I think it's important to look similarly, this is sort of a cross industry cut, looking at what are the actual costs associated with getting a DC fast charger uh, in the ground. Um, and these costs vary wildly between sites. So I've tried to provide a range uh, for what those costs could be from low to high uh, in two different scenarios, thinking about deploying two 50 kilowatt chargers, which is sort of the standard DC fast charging power level that you see out uh, in the wild right now, uh, as well as um, 150 kilowatt uh, charger deployments. There's a lot of difference you know, in what the industry makes and there's a wide spectrum, but looking at these huge cost differences, the capital costs are obviously gonna be much more intensive uh, uh, on the DC fast charging side. And as you increase that power, uh, that'll grow unnecessarily. So that might not be so much of a shocking revelation, but what I think is important from a planning perspective is to really get a sense of what kind of scope and scale you're talking about uh, before uh, we uh, start imagining, let's get a DC fast charger on every corner. 90% um, of charging can take place for personal vehicles at home and at work. But when we start to think about, well, if we wanna support uh, the university games, what type of fleet needs do we have? There you start to have a little bit less flexibility uh, because you wanna make sure that at the end of the day that this vehicle can do what it's supposed to do, which is have the wheels turn. Uh, so um, I'd like to go to the next slide. And this is where things get uh, to the point where sometimes I make folks' eyes cross because it's not as exciting to everyone else as it is to me to talk about electricity rates, but I'm going to do it really quickly. So um, what I want to have as a takeaway uh, for folks is that one of the more challenging barriers, all right, especially given 
some of the fantastic policies and programs that the state is already pursuing. Uh, on the capital side, right, we've got some deployment programs. We heard from NIPA, NYSERDA. We've got some investor-owned utility programs that are really helping to deploy, get over that capital cost barrier. The real challenge that I want folks to think about is, well, what about the operating costs, all right? Can we get the stations in the ground? Yeah, lots of great ways to do that, but can you afford to turn them on? And that can be really challenging. So the way that electricity rates are structured for these high powered stations wasn't really designed for the way that DC fast chargers work. Commercial and industrial electricity rates are baked in with the assumption that you're effectively uh, a factory and you're gonna be on for 12, 14 hours a day. DC fast charging stations are on uh, for much shorter periods of time and during especially earlier periods of adoption or in less traveled corridors, they're going to have very infrequent utilization. This is referred to as, you know, having a low load factor, not being very frequently used. The way that the rates are structured traditionally means that the costs for your electricity aren't just how much energy you consume, but how much demand you could put on the grid. And that potential cost makes up anywhere from 23 to 85 percent of the electricity costs for a deployment of DC fast charging stations. That is a significant amount of operating funding that is difficult to recover because if only one person plugs in uh, for a few days, all of a sudden you're paying for um, the potential demand of being on for again that 12 or 14 hours. You can't recover that kind of cost from one fleet vehicle uh, use or one public um, visitor. So. That's not to say that it's all doom and gloom. There are a lot of really great solutions to these issues that are already being um, implemented in other spots around the country. Uh, and there are some initial steps that have been taken in New York. But again, just to think about, there are some capital barriers and some operating cost barriers. So if we could um, move on to the next slide. From the capital cost perspective, we already heard about a lot of the great programs, right? So there are, um, incentive programs to help push down some of those upfront capital costs, typically largely associated with um, the installation. Uh, so those are all gonna be important to consider. But one of the other things to think about is what are the steps that can be taken so that we could potentially avoid having to uh, leverage those incentive programs altogether. So electric vehicle requirements in public construction. Uh, so for city and county uh, projects, having parking spots be prepared from day one with the wiring and the conduit in place to support the future installation of a charger significantly avoids all of these retrofit costs altogether. And so that's referred to as EV ready uh, requirements. These can be solely applied through, you know, the unilateral decision of public entities, or they can apply to both public and private entities through a uh, local uh, building construction code requirements. So what are the things that we can do for the capital projects we already have in store uh, for the next few years? And how can we make sure that we're future proofing those investments? So that's one thing to think about. There's a few other examples, but I don't want to just have a deluge. The other piece ties back to that operating cost issue. So if I made your eyes go cross, I apologize. What I will say is that even if you don't want to go into those weeds with me on figuring out what that solution is, there are many states around the country that are thinking about, well, how do we restructure the way that we design electricity rates? There's a lot of great examples of that happening. Um, and uh, there's an opportunity to create rates that collect the cost to serve uh, that customer and have a more sustainable model for operation of these really unique critical pieces of infrastructure. So there is um, legislation uh, before the assembly and the Senate uh, linked down at the end of that slide to require utilities to file just alternatives to these rates, not to dictate what those alternatives look like, but just to make sure that we start addressing the problem now. There's a short term um, grant program uh, that has been authorized by the Public Service Commission, but really making sure that predictable costs uh, can hit uh, is gonna be important, particularly for fleet operators who are the closest thing in the real world that we have uh, to rational economic actors. The rest of us uh, are not so good at that. Um, other things to consider that I didn't include on, on this slide and I'll wrap it up there is that 
there's an interesting approach that's being considered uh, in New York State to establish a low carbon fuel standard, which essentially creates an incentive for using lower carbon intensive fuels and disincentivizes higher carbon intensive fuels. So programs like this exist uh, on the West Coast uh, throughout Canada um, and can be critical tools. Uh, so there is legislation uh, filed by Assembly Warner, uh, Assembly Bill 5262A, um, and there's a group called Clean Fuels New York, which is trying to uh, create uh, momentum for this type of an approach, which would really help both public and private operators. So I've thrown a lot at you. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to present and looking forward to the discussion. Great, thanks, Kevin, I appreciate it. Super interesting to see the breakdown of the numbers of the capital and operating costs. And uh, as Rebecca just, as just noted in the uh, chat boxes, you know, breaking down that concept of um, demand charges and why um, the, the rate structures sort of that are designed for a bigger office building or hospital or some other type energy user um, that aren't, aren't really exactly ideal for uh, an EV charging. So that's, I appreciate sharing that. I'm sure that was really interesting for everybody um, uh, on, this, uh, on this session. So with that, let's uh, jump over to Travis and I would like to hear from you next. Great, well, thank you. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to get to hear these great presentations and uh, meet you all virtually today. I am also really sad uh, that I can't be there in person. Um, I'm a little north of you in the woods uh, between Toronto and uh, Montreal. And um, I'm gonna talk today, so, Benjamin, you were right that that was what I was supposed to talk about, about climate and EV charging, but I got really uh, inspired and excited by the idea of, of, of using the games to try to create a legacy infrastructure. And because we have a lot of experience working on rural um, deployments and because one of my colleagues dad ran a lot of the facilities for prior Olympic games, um, I was like, no, I got to talk about legacy and I've got to talk about how you design these kinds of systems um, to, to leave a legacy. Uh, so if it's okay, I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, but That's great. But, please do. This is working okay. Oh, this, that's perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, I... Uh, so I work for Flow and Add Energy. Um, the two names can be complicated, but really when you think of Add Energy, it's very, very high quality North American made charging stations for home work and, uh, and public on the go use. Um, and then when you hear Flow, uh, think one of the leading North American charging networks. We happen to use the Add Energy stations and, and the two companies are of course related. Uh, we've made a lot of stations. Um, we've deployed them all over North America and uh, I, was, I was glad that uh, Adam mentioned the cold. We've actually deployed them up in the Yukon um, and they're, they're working. Uh, <laughs> that's really important because we're from uh, Quebec. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, uh, kind of all, all market segments, um, some of the ones that we're really known for in addition to our home uh, product is, is our curbside station and our, and our fast chargers, but uh, also a robust line of level twos. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I, there's a, there's a couple different things I wanted to share and I'm gonna go from sort of highest conceptual down to really granular um, geospatial deployment tips and tricks. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is this idea about how we try to get inclusive deployment of charging stations. So what I like to say is that equitable adoption of EVs starts with inclusive deployment of charging stations. Um, when we started working uh, in the United States, I, I asked a colleague to look at how EVs are deployed between rural and urban areas. Um, and the, the last stats I've seen on this suggest that um, metropolitan areas represent 55% uh, of the population and have 80% of the EVs. I'm sure that's out of date now because <laughs> uh, things are changing quickly, but I, I think the trend is largely still true. 
Um, in the province of Quebec, where uh, Flow and Ant Energy are from, um, we have the highest concentration of EVs in Canada, 42% compared to 23% of the population, and um, basically an equitable split between the largest cities and the deployment of EVs. And that, for me, is really important because um, it's it kind of cuts away at this narrative that EVs are for city, rich city people, and uh, and that you know people who live in rural areas can't drive them or it's it's not good for them, and that's important because frankly that narrative does us no favors. Um, it's not true, first of all, and also it it can really impact uh, EV adoption and the climate goals we're all trying to achieve. Um, this picture here, I'm gonna talk about this region twice today, so I'll introduce it. Um, the Gaspé Peninsula is a, kind of a very famous part of Quebec, very beautiful. You can see lots of nice trees and eat amazing food and see whales. So it's a, it's a popular driving route. It is also incredibly far from Montreal, like 10 hours uh, driving. And um, what is, Fascinating is that uh, Hydro Quebec, which is the big utility in, in Quebec, they invested a lot in, in charging stations, and we have some stations there too. Um, and they have been able to encourage tourists to actually make that really long trek and to visit the Gaspé uh, Peninsula in their EVs, even though it has fairly low population density compared to some of the more uh, metropolitan areas. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but but that's sort of an example of, I think, you know, trying to to be more uh, equitable in terms of or inclusive in terms of um, deployment. Um, and I'll talk about what that led to in a sec. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, second kind of principle or takeaway is that I think it is really possible and worthwhile to support tourism by connecting to regional hubs. Um, and this is, uh, I think, something that probably will factor into your decision making as you look at what kind of legacy uh, can happen here. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I picked the most popular skiing area in Quebec, um, which is called Mont Tremblant, and the drive from uh, Montreal, which is of course the biggest city. Uh, so this is a 90 mile drive. And in that area, there are 20 fast DC charging stations, fast DCFC charging stations. Um, these are not like enormous super high kilowatt stations. So they're primarily 50 kilowatts uh, because they're much cheaper to install uh, from an electrical, well, all the things that Kevin was talking about. Um, but basically what you can take away from this is you have to almost make an effort not to be able to charge between Montreal and the major skiing destination. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so just to echo some of the things that uh, were pointed out earlier by Rebecca and Adam, very different story between um, Montreal and Lake Placid, uh, which is almost the same distance, so 110 miles. Um, and basically the, the only current uh, deployments are two Tesla supercharger sites, which is not so helpful if you're not driving a Tesla. Um, now, of course, there may be level two options, but that's not really the same thing for a commuter who's looking to, to make a quick trip. And obviously, this is just one potential source of tourists for Lake Placid. I know there's folks in Vermont and Boston and others, but, you know, I just wanted to illustrate that, that these are the kinds of sort of regional connective links that I think can make a big difference in terms of long-term legacy and that we see um, supporting local tourism, particularly if you're looking at getting people from cities that have higher EV adoption rates like Montreal, for example. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I promised I would get back to the Gas Bay region. Um, maybe this is because I really wanted to do a road trip there this summer and I wasn't able to go, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty sad about that. But um, I asked our analytics team to just pull the data on our stations deployed in this fairly remote uh, region. Um, and what they told me is, I mean, obviously it's been a steady there's been significant increase year over year. Part of that is because we've been deploying additional stations there. Um, but what I thought was super interesting is that uh, I asked them to look just at the months of July to September. And um, we had an increase in the use of our stations in this region 
even while public charging in Canada fell by 18% because of COVID-19. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting because I think it supports my assumption that people were looking for local tourism opportunities. They were going for beautiful drives from the major cities and um, that despite you know, overall uh, declines, which is interesting. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I pulled the very uh, unimpressive numbers from 2017, oh, well, well, or trends, I should say. Um, so, you know, we saw, this was when we first started deploying some stations in, in that region, very, very minimal. Um, and, you know, the big lesson we drew from that was at, at that point, we were primarily only getting tourist traffic for these, for these stations. So this was clearly something that was summer peaking, which suggests it's people driving in from out of town and then leaving. Um, but if you can go to the next slide, in 2019, even though there is definitely some data skewing from uh, the COVID lockdown that occurred at the same place in time and in Quebec as in, in other places, um, what we see is that there's less of a differential between the summer peak and the sort of uh, rest of the year usage, and it, it tends to be a bit more stable. And from that, we, t we assume that it means that you've got more local people who've started adopting EVs and feeling comfortable driving EVs. And so I think, you know, in addition to being sort of an interesting tourist type attraction, it also started to create value for local residents and opportunities. Um, so I personally found that exciting uh, as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so I promised I would get really granular here. Um, I pilfered some of the suggestions we made to another Canadian province about uh, rural and uh, provincial um, fast charging deployment. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, point number one, as I, uh, as I was saying, we do a lot of winter deployments and oh my gosh, you do not wanna get in between someone in the snow and their charge. So just by all means, make sure that if you're deploying in a, in a region that has extreme weather, that you have enough uh, rugged charging stations um, and they're, you know, carefully and safely designed for snow plows, especially. Uh, next slide, please. Reliability and redundancy. So um, extremely important just to make sure that you have a good sense of whether the stations are performing as promised because you definitely don't want people showing up at stations that don't work. Um, really important as well to have a level two, at least one level two backup for any DCFC. Um, obviously you, want, you don't want people using that if they're expecting a DC fast charge, but very, very important to have a backup because things can happen before your maintenance teams can get there, especially if you're more remote. Um, so that's really important. And then networked uh, stations, Kevin also mentioned the importance or, or that networking, um, you want to have the ability to push updates over the air in case something changes with vehicles or, or charging conditions. So those are all important. Um, next slide. Okay. So siting considerations. If you are deploying on a major freeway or major highways, um, it's important to consider the way that people use these kinds of interchanges. And ideally, if you can deploy your station so that it's more natural for people to pull off, and you'll often see that pattern in gas stations as well. So, so looking at ways to do kitty corner deployments or, or things like that. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> don't forget the grades. Don't forget the steep mountain passes. This was for a very mountainous uh, province, but I think the same applies in the Adirondacks. Um, so if you are using a distance-based um, heuristic or metric to try to decide like what you want your station density to be, just keep in mind that the, the distance for a flat drive is going to be different than a distance for a uh, drive with a steep climb, particularly because, as Adam mentioned, there can be some winter uh, battery vampires, and so you want to you want to make sure that people feel comfortable if they have to drive over a steep area. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and then the long detour. So again, if you are using some sort of of distance or or other form of density based targets for how you're deploying, 
just make sure that you consider the user experience. And so noting that like as the crow flies, distances or even driving distances can feel really strange if you're asking someone to detour significantly from a major through fair or a major um, interchange. Um, so those are, you know, just some ideas. I have a lot more for islands, but uh, I don't think we have the same issues here in the Adirondacks, so I won't go into those. Um, next slide, please. Okay, finally, final point, and then I promise to stop because I went over time. Um, consider congestion. It is critically important to look at how many people are using your stations and recognize <clears throat> that people tend to cluster temporally. And so um, even if you have enough slots for someone to charge all day long, most people don't charge at 4 a.m. So um, congestion is a whole other, other thing, but something to keep in mind. Uh, okay, and uh, next slide, please. That's all. Um, thank you so much for, for having me. Looking forward to some questions and, uh, and please feel free to find me on uh, Twitter or anywhere else. Thanks. Travis, that was outstanding. Thank you. That's really helpful to see your lessons learned and examples uh, on inclusiveness and how can you plan for those routes? Because I, I think showing the difference between what's happening north of the border and south of the border is, uh, is, a, is a good reminder that we got a lot of opportunity there. So that, that's great. Thank you. Really helpful. Um, well, we're right on schedule. So this is great. We have time for some good questions uh, from, from the audience and some others that uh, have come up during this. And I think I'll, maybe I'll start with Rebecca real quickly. Um, since you work with the local communities as the power provider and you're doing all this work to invest in uh, infrastructure across the region and statewide, of course, like how do you see NIPA working with communities individually to get more deployment? So you've talked about the, the broader, you know, array of the things you're trying to do and what some of those needs are, but how do you see NIPA's role in, in diving in to help communities get more deployed, especially in, in North Country? Um, so we do have an electric vehicle accelerator community in Fairport, New York. It's near Rochester. And that's really a demonstration project, both on the technical side and on the people side. You'll find in talking to me that I always come back to the people side. It's the part that I find most interesting. But on the tech side, you know, we're experimenting with networked residential chargers, looking at demand response. Um, we've worked with them to install 27, with NYSERDA as well, um, to install a network 27 public level two chargers. And we're about to do a ribbon cutting on two direct current fast chargers in Fairport as well. And then on the human side, we're, you know, we're doing some tests and learn when it comes to the marketing, adoption, education. I think a lot of municipal governments wanna see examples. They wanna know, did this have a big impact on my load factor for, the, for better or for worse? Um, they wanna know, you know, did charging increase EV adoption? Were dealerships, um, you know, more apt to play, you know, to, to promote electric vehicles if there's greater infrastructure. So I think, um, you know, leading by example, opening up that dialogue is really important. Um, we're also working on the downtown revitalization initiative with Department of State. So I think some of that is about working with, um, you know, local governments to put chargers, um, you know, in communities um, that might be subject to some inequity around energy and to make really decisive steps to make sure that energy equity is part of um, the conversation and to talk about what that means so that communities aren't redlined from this really great market transformation around electrification. Um, and particularly in the North Country, you know, I, I think for us on the fast charging side, um, you know, we're pretty strategic about where we're siting locations. We're thinking about that customer experience, but there's a huge amount of work to be done still around level two and the role that that plays for attracting customers to businesses, encouraging tourism. Um, so, you know, we're, we're always kind of working with our municipal customers in an advisory role, and we work closely with NYSERDA to make sure that they're taking advantage of incentives and the data that NYSERDA has available. Great. Yeah, thanks. And, and so if uh, communities wanted to band together to come to NIPA and say, how can you help us? Do they contact you or is there an on-ramp for that sort of activity? Um, are you There's asking specifically about like direct current fast charging or for level two? Uh, both. I mean, uh, either, but whatever, you know, if there are two different paths, what would they be? 
Yeah, I mean, I think really on level two, honestly, like we, we defer a lot to NYSERDA when it comes to the incentives. On level two, as Kevin pointed out, the upfront capital costs are, are so much more affordable. Um, we do support municipal governments and our business customers with construction. We help to lead them through the installation process, especially if it's a larger workplace charging endeavor or something like that. Um, and on direct current fast chargers, we love to hear from communities who say, you know, we're seeing an uptick in adoption. We think that fast charging is really important for our area and it's not currently present. So I convene, um, you know, advocates on a quarterly basis. I take um, requests from them in terms of where they see the need, EV advocate groups, um, in terms of where they see the need for fast charging. So they could certainly, you know, reach out to me to talk about a great site that they have in mind and we would evaluate, just like I talked about in the presentation, looking at the graphic distribution, grid capacity, and then amenities for the driver. And I love that everyone touched on, you know, um, customer service and making sure that the customer has a really great charging experience. Great. Yeah, thanks. And that focus on the amenities, I think is so important that, you know, as a traveler, you don't want to have to make multiple stops. I know as the, as the primary driver when we're taking a family trip around, you know, they, if you have to stop one place for food, another place for a bathroom, and the third place maybe for charging or fueling that's uh, you know one one too many stops somebody has to wait right so it, uh, there's a whole there's I mean if you want to see horror stories about road trips in an EV they are vast and humorous and scary and we're looking to really make those a thing of the past we don't want that to be the you know bad rap that you think of when when you think of an EV road trip so certainly you know I think I was so happy to hear all these presentations kind of naturally building on each other and I think about all these different facets that, you know, each of us plays a very different role in the similar space and it all builds toward a better customer experience, making EVs an easier choice, simpler choice, um, you know, a less anxiety <laughs> um, inducing choice. So, I, you know, I was happy to see that continuity and um, yeah, I think that was kind of a theme. Definitely, yeah, this is a great group here uh, and everything really, has fit together well so far. Kevin, I've got a question for you. Um, we had a question that came in related to uh, maybe a sensitive subject, but road taxes. So that says, well, you know, an EV isn't buying gas, so they're not paying the road tax. Is there discussion or is there a way to maybe augment um, the billing process perhaps or incorporate some point of that so that EV uh, users, you know, based on their charging, which is equivalent to gas usage in terms of, you know, mileage and over the road impact um, could flow back to help pay for things. Is, is, there a, is there a process underway or discussion or is there a mechanism in place for that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's one I think that uh, as a community needs to be in, engaged more uh, proactively uh, so that we can ensure that we don't get sidetracked by failing to address it until we get to you know market saturation and all of a sudden we can't uh, address uh, road upkeep. So I think there's a lot of ways to think about it. At the highest level, all drivers should pay their fair share for the roads, right? So that has to be, you know, the underlying common principle. Then thinking about, well, what's the best way to do that moving forward for all the different use cases? It starts to get trickier. Um, so I can point to some conversations that have been underway and a couple of examples of how the issue is starting to be addressed. At the federal level, uh, what we're starting to see um, is more of a focus on vehicle miles traveled, right? So there are some studies that are currently underway um, and what this Congress has failed to address, uh, but plans to address next year uh, is to reauthorize uh, the surface transportation funding. And in the draft version of that language is a much uh, greater scaled up focus on how do we create a sustainable non-invasive uh, means uh, for uh, collecting road revenues that's tied to the amount of distance you're traveling and your individual wear and tear on the road. So in the longer term, that is partly where the conversation's going. So how do we deal with it now? Um, there are a number of different states uh, that have sort of taken uh, on a spectrum of more sustainable to incredibly punitive um, additional registration fees for electric vehicles. Uh, in some cases, the amounts that are set is sort of commensurate with what one might typically 
uh, pay and contribute uh, if you were driving an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, there is a, a boisterous debate about, you know, what's a fair level? Is that the best way to collect road revenue? Um, what I will say is that there's an interesting model out of Colorado where of a registration fee that has been set, I believe it's 70% is dedicated towards um, road revenue, like would typically be contributed. 30% is dedicated towards a fund uh, that supports the deployment of additional charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about what are the sort of interim steps, what are the ways that we can make sure that fees that are being collected are tied to the type of infrastructure that we need to see out there? Um, one of the other things that I'll point to is that there is often a discussion, well, what about at the charger? All right, so how do we, you know, it's, a, it's an analog, there's electrons flowing through, uh, isn't that the same um, as gas, and can't we just tax on a volumetric rate? That can be really challenging, and it can be incredibly inequitable. Uh, so let me unpack a little bit about why. It can be challenging because uh, in many cases, the states that already sort of have that on the books, and Pennsylvania is one example, they have an equivalent to the gas tax for lots of different forms of uh, fuel, uh, and there is one for electricity. The Department of Transportation in Pennsylvania will be the first to tell you that they're just not collecting that revenue. In most cases, because 90% of charging takes place behind a utility's existing meter um, and is not necessarily visible. So if most charging is taking place at home, well, how do we make sure we're collecting that? Um, there are some discussions that have taken place in Iowa uh, where the solution that has been proposed is, well, let's just focus on public charging. But that's challenging because then only the folks who don't have access to dedicated overnight charging are, are uh, subsidizing those who do, right? So I think that it's a, a, a challenge where we see some potential long-term solutions. And in the interim, there has to be a discussion about it. Uh, but um, any one potential answer for it can still be structured in a way that overall contributes to uh, the growth uh, and fairness uh, in terms of who's contributing what and how do we not just look at you know, subsidizing or paying for yesterday's infrastructure, but for the infrastructure that we need now and in the future. Great. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Obviously, a, a hot topic that needs to, that it's going to take a lot of attention to get, get right. Definitely. Um, Adam, for you, I mean, you have this uh, amazing organization that uh, looks at the latest and greatest best practices, you know, across the state, across the nation. Um, you know, what do you think are some best practices that, uh, or programs or approaches that we might want to consider? Now that you've got a chance to hear from everything, or if you have any comments um, on, on any of the topics that have come up so far? Well, so first I, I agree. It's been, it's been a really interesting discussion and uh, I really liked uh, Travis's deep dive into, into rural EV charging. That, I thought that was great. And, uh, you know, I, I, Kevin, I, I, I thought uh, your, your discussion of some of the challenges around charging was, uh, was really spot on and and Rebecca I know you and I uh talk all the time but uh it, it's always and it's always great to be on a panel with you um I think that where you know one of one of the big things that uh provides a, a great opportunity to um to try some new things at an at in a, in a situation like you've got here is some real innovative and creative approaches to, um, to the manage, to manage charging. Um, you know, when you talk about the needs for a, an event like the world university games, um, and going from, you know, from, typically a few shuttle buses running around town to, you know, dozens. Um, the, the grid isn't built for that. And, you know, as, as Kevin was saying earlier, the electric rates aren't built for that. Uh, the, the, you know, infrastructure, charging infrastructure generally is not, is not uh, sized for that kind of thing. And um, one of the, one of the, 
answers can be one of the many different approaches to managed charging. And I, I say that um, for, those of, for those of you who aren't as familiar with the concept, um, it's similar to um, you know, managed, uh, managing your electric load in a building. Uh, same concept that uh, you try to reduce your peak load. Yes, you, you try to get efficiencies you know, throughout the process, but, but um, because of the demand charges that Kevin was talking about earlier, um, the peak the peak is really the key and to be able to spread out your charging across the day and especially if you have time of use rates to overnight hours where the electricity is lower because the demands on the grid are lower um, I, I think that that's a big opportunity to make it so that you're not gonna either have to pay you know a huge amount of for demand charges, a huge amount for the infrastructure, or a huge amount for uh, for battery uh, energy energy storage, or or on-site generation, uh, so that you don't have to make some of the grid upgrades. But uh, to get that much power into that many vehicles at once is going to be a challenge. And um, and thinking through what can we do and so managed charging really operate is a, is a whole spectrum everything from just thinking about when you need to charge and scheduling it uh and a lot of electric cars can can schedule it uh you can you know type in the time that you want the charging to start or you even can use a you know a, a light timer uh in in a lot of case in in cer certain cases uh something something like that um to a little bit more sophisticated and and you know responding to time of use rates um, or uh, participating in demand response programs like uh, utility offers for buildings um, to more complex things like vehicle to grid power where you could do bi-directional charging charge sometimes from the grid into the car and then when it's advantageous take power out of the car battery and put it back onto the grid um, that's probably much more complex than is needed uh, in most cases, but there are a lot of different flavors here and a lot of, uh, and, and I think each of them has some potential opportunities to make uh, charging a fleet of electric vehicles or really doing a deep electrification uh, within a town or within a community in the North Country. I, it doesn't have to be Lake Placid. You, you think about you know Potsdam, and it, it would be really awesome to have a big push for electrification in a place like Potsdam or Plattsburgh or or um, something like that. And uh, and you can you can think about what scenarios might look like for how do we do that both in getting the cars there, but then really to make sure that the grid can handle it. Um, I think there are some cool cool breakthroughs that are that are coming in that regard great thanks adam that's really helpful to think strategically uh, as we're talking about and kevin been sharing some of the numbers helps to quantify the benefit financially as well as just infrastructure wise to planning what is that demand going to look like um, how can we do it locally you know within a feeder line or something that would might be help to find ways to to combine demand response right with those so thanks for sharing that i think that's really helpful to think through a lot a lot of thinking has to go in on the planning side to know what that load could be um, and are there ways to incent it through there um i've got one question i know we're getting close to time for travis um on planning because you clearly have thought about this and have the experience and you teased us with a little bit of experience from prior games as well um you know how would we think about planning not only for the short term but how do we get the long-term benefit Right, because it sounds like what you've what you've shared is thinking long term, not just a single event going out to the peninsula there, but um, you know that's a, that's the long term. But if we if we want to do something short term and plan for that, you know, how do we marry that together with the long term benefit? And then how do we build excitement around it? So how do we say, wow, we're doing this today to be you know the region of the future, right? To really demonstrate that there's something big. Because right now I see sort of a blank slate. So how do we make this uh, really a world-class region from electrification and get the most out of it? So do you have any, any thoughts on that? I sure do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, 
but but I'll, I promise to be concise. Uh, we did a really great project uh, between the Kootenai region in the mountains of BC and uh, Calgary, which is a, a plain city. Uh, where a local group actually did a, a pretty great network called the Peaks to Prairies Network. And um, they made a really big effort to communicate with the communities about the benefits. And they had a really great social media presence and they, they made sure to announce it with local politicians and have people drive the distance, including the politicians. Um, I think for, for regional connectivity type, projects that can be really really helpful it gets buy-in obviously from the political folks and, and also gets in some cases some really great local media coverage uh, which built excitement so i think that's one way um, the other thing is to look very carefully at who your potential legacy users are so you know big opportunities school boards anybody that uses buses that have a profile that naturally lend themselves towards the use of level two charging stations. Um, so depending on the, the length of your school routes and the, the use of the buses during and after school hours, um, that's a big opportunity. Uh, identifying what I would call like your parking assets. So, so looking at what parking spaces are within the, the different groups that you either control or can work with and have collaborative relationships with um, is a really huge opportunity for trying to find some of those spots where you could deploy stations that will be useful for tourists or for, uh, for local shoppers and, and things in the long term as well. Great, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I, th I think you, when you're teeing this up about the long-term benefit in my mind, it gets me thinking about, you know, what would we do anyway? And then how do we overlay that into this event, right? So maybe if the event buses are going to be during the daytime and the school buses are uh, morning and evening, then there's a way to bring those together from a planning perspective and a demand perspective and those sort of things. So a lot, lot to think about. Um, Jared, we are about at time. Uh, we do have uh, some more interesting questions, but I, I want to be sensitive to the panelists. And this has been an amazing discussion and I think really got the juices flowing. So this is something that we want to share on our report out on Monday. But it, do, should we keep going or should we try to wrap it up? What do you think? Uh, we can wrap it up. I think we've had a pretty good Q&A segment and um, certainly don't want to ask more of folks more of their time. So I think we can close it down. Great. Well, I know you're going to share the slides, which has everyone's contact information, and we'll have a report out on Monday at 9.30 a.m. with a summary of all the different sessions and how they fit together. Um, on Thursday, just a couple other notes. We have a grid capacity discussion, so that's probably pretty relevant to some of the demand topics that just came out um, at, uh, tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. And then on Friday at noon, it's uh, part two of Clarkson's uh, Understanding Community Needs discussion, which if you guys had a chance to read through the day one report, that was really uh, interesting to see what they're harvesting from the community on needs and challenges also. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, uh, all the panelists for coming out and sharing uh, your background and experience. And thanks to the participants, uh, everyone that came out to listen to this. And, and uh, I, I see this as the beginning of the discussion, not the end by any means. So this is a, a great way to kick it off and get things rolling. So with that, thank you so much, and um, we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks.